I'm going to summarize our current thinking on how T cell immunity to COVID-19 um, may uh, occur and relationships uh, of that to vaccine correlates and, and mechanisms of, of protection. Um, uh, I've really got uh, three main points, uh, all related to what are mechanisms of protective immunity against COVID-19. Uh, uh, first, simplest option for any vaccine development is high level long lasting neutralizing antibodies. Second, uh, nevertheless, various lines of evidence do point to substantial protective contributions of T cells against COVID-19. And, and third, with all of these things in mind, uh, it is quite reasonable to consider that, that serious cases of COVID-19, i.e. hospitalization level COVID-19, it is prevented by, by any decent combination of antibodies and or CD4s and or CD8s. Okay. Um, so to go through each of those three main points in turn, um, first, the simplest option for any vaccine development is high level long lasting neutralizing antibodies for any virus or pathogen that is susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. And, and this virus is clearly susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. Um, and Stanley Blotkin has said for, for decades now, um, it's uh, well established that, that almost all of the previously licensed human vaccines, non COVID vaccines, um, have antibodies as either the mechanism or correlate of immunity. Um, antibodies are the only mechanism that can provide truly sterilizing immunity. And, and even when antibodies aren't the mechanism or aren't the only mechanism of protective immunity, um, they are a correlate of CD4s. Uh, and that's because almost all neutralizing antibody responses depend on CD4 T cells. Thus, the presence of antibody titers are, are usually a surrogate marker of vaccine specific CD4 T cells, uh, specifically uh, TFH cells. Um, <clears throat> But with all of that in, in, in mind, if you can't get high level neutralizing antibodies or that they're obviated by variants or if the antibody levels aren't long lasting, um, are there other potential mechanisms of protective immunity, i.e. Uh, notably T cells? Uh, and so that brings us to the second point, uh, which is uh, various lines of evidence point to substantial protective contributions of T cells against COVID-19. Um, T cell responses correlate with better outcomes in natural infection. Um, uh, here I'm just pointing out uh, some highlights. This isn't a comprehensive uh, uh, review of the field. Um, here's work from our lab um, looking in uh, acute cases. This is either the largest or one of the largest studies uh, available to date where virus specific CD8 T cells, CD4 T cells, and neutralizing antibodies were all examined in the same people and every single person uh, in, in a cohort. And the take home messages from that study were that coordinated adaptive immunity looks like it's protective immunity, i.e. the presence of, of CD4, CD8s and antibodies um, all appear to be beneficial. But in terms of statistical associations indicated by the astrocytes, it was the T cells that appeared to be uh, doing the heavy lifting because it was CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells that has statistical associations with better outcomes uh, and not antibodies. And, and the absence of a, a positive association with antibodies has been seen in, in many studies. Um, or to flip this on its head, um, the absence of a CD8 T cell response or a CD8 T cell response was associated with a, a higher likelihood of a poor outcome. And um, those outcomes were age associated. Um, uh, less likely to have good T cell responses with, with advanced age. Uh, a separate study made similar conclusions by the group of Antonio Bertoletti with the additional advantage that they actually tracked viral loads in their study. And so they could observe that actually early T cell responses correlated with better control of, of viral loads. Uh, separately, there's excellent data published by Baruch and colleagues that CD8 T cells um, can help provide control of, of SARS-CoV-2 infections in monkeys. Um, third, the uh, outpatient clinical trials of monoclonal antibody therapy uh, are actually pretty strong indirect evidence of, of the value of T cells because while these trials showed clear clinical value in the outpatient setting, even with 
massive neutralizing antibody titers in these people, there was a surprisingly modest impact on viral loads. Whereas in, in contrast, people in the placebo group who made their own immune responses had thousand fold better reductions of, of viral loads. And, and a simple interpretation of, of that would be that T cells are, are then important for controlling viral loads. T cells were not directly studied in those tests, uh, in those studies, so that, that remains to be determined, um, but it is a plausible interpretation. Uh, fourth, um, if uh, antibody responses were, uh, were absolutely essential for, for controlling this infection, uh, we would expect uh, uh, very high fatality rates amongst people with uh, uh, antibody deficiencies. Uh, and yet instead, re reviews of the literature have, have largely found uh, a moderately increased risk. That, so that is not to say that antibodies aren't valuable, but the question is, in the absence of antibodies, can the immune system still get by, i.e. probably with um, T cell responses to control this infection? And these data largely indicate yes, uh, uh, particularly if, if one can exclude additional comorbidities, which is why uh, studies in people with multiple sclerosis um, are, are of value because there are fewer uh, immune suppression and other comorbidities compared to studies in, in cancer patients. Um, certainly more work needs to be done there, but there are indications. Uh, lastly, um, it's always important to consider the, the anatomy and kinetics of the infectious disease being considered. And in the case of SARS-CoV-2, it um, its biology is a very rapid infection in nasopharyngeal spaces and in the oral cavity, um, but actually a rather slow infection in the lungs. And it's the lungs that, that's where the clinically relevant disease occurs, the pneumonia, um, ARDS in death. And so the fact that this infection is relatively slow in the lungs, which again is the clinically relevant site, does give the immune response um, substantial time to potentially control that infection. And it makes it more likely that the T cells um, can provide meaningful contributions to, to control of, of COVID-19 disease. <clears throat> um, with all of that in mind, in terms of T cells uh, showing mechanistically that they're involved in control or using them as correlative protection, the burden of proof for T cells is challenging because even when T cells are mechanistically important for protection, uh, evidence uh, usually lags compared to antibodies because T cell studies are, are much more resource intensive um, and, and also uh, these additional reasons here um, of, of additional complexities. Which brings us to the third uh, point, um, that in light of all of that, uh, I think it's quite reasonable to consider as a working model that, that hospitalization level COVID is, is prevented by any decent combination of antibodies and or CD4s and CD8s. Um, and conditions where this may be important from a vaccine perspective, uh, it may be important in natural immunity when antibody titers are low, but, but for today, the main focus is on, is on vaccines. Um, and conditions where this may be important uh, when thinking about vaccines are, are as follows. Um, first, for current, currently used vaccines, um, understanding vaccine-generated immunity uh, <clears throat> and either correlates or mechanisms of protection. First, with neutralizing antibody escape variants, uh, the, the relevant roles of different compartments of the immune system may, may shift. Um, and uh, here's my, my cartoon um, schematizing this, that in, in terms of the amount of protection provided, as, as variants become more divergent, uh, and i.e. less neutralizing antibody activity against them, it may be that the protection observed become, antibodies become a smaller component of that protection and more of the protection uh, becomes dependent on the CD4, CD8, T cells and the memory B cells, all of which are much more resistant to, to divergence of, of the variants. Um, and so, uh, yeah, mechanisms of protection can vary depending on, on, on the variant divergence. And it's plausible that this is happening um, currently in the B1351, the South Africa variant, and, and the observed J&J &J vaccine protection, where the J&J &J vaccine actually had a very modest shift in, in measurable protection between uh, the parental strain and, and, and B1351, and yet 
there's a large loss of neutralizing antibodies um, of that vaccine against B1351, suggesting that, that other components of the immune system may be important for the protective immunity observed. Much more data needs to be uh, available um, uh, for such a conclusion, but it's worth uh, considering. Uh, second would be um, immunocompromised or immunosuppressed individuals. These are very, this is a very important population to consider. These are people who are highly susceptible to severe or fatal COVID-19, uh, and yet they are also the most likely individuals to fail to make an antibody response to the vaccines or make a very poor antibody response. So is it that in those individuals or in some of those individuals, uh, vaccine-generated T-cell immunity may be sufficient, not, not as good as having everything, but may be sufficient to provide a reasonable amount of protective immunity. Um, and so that's key to consider when considering both mechanisms and correlates of, of protection um, as they may apply differently to different uh, human populations. Third, that um, vaccine-generated immunity, the mechanisms may be different in different time windows post-vaccination. Uh, one is the very early after a single RNA vaccine, um, many observers have noted the presence of protective immunity starting at, at day 10 or 14, um, but that's uh, before neutralizing antibodies are detected in most individuals by most assays, whereas T cells are detected by that time point as are binding antibodies, um, whereas after two immunizations, neutralizing antibodies are, are quite strong. So is it that this early immunity is due to um, different mechanisms and so different time windows being providing different immunity. And the second aspect of this is that we noted in our immune memory study um, in, in science that the different compartments of immunological memory to SARS-CoV-2 have different relationships with each other over time. It's not a stable relationship. The immune memory compartment isn't stable and different compartments within immune memory um, are stable to different degrees. And so over time, uh, it may be that, that the mechanisms of protective immunity one month post immunization may not be identical to the mechanisms of protective immunity at one or two years uh, post immunization. Um, and of course, thinking towards the future of uh, other vaccines that people may uh, attempt to bring to market, um, certainly some of those have deep, uh, are proposed to have T cell dominant mechanisms of action. Um, how would those be assessed and, and demonstrated? And then similar, uh, I think, for mucosal vaccines that may have more complex mechanisms of action. Uh, uh, so that is what I uh, wanted to cover. Thanks for your time.